Hello, Pamela. Oh, I Hi. Can't... Oh, it's coming out of the wrong... Hold on. I'm going to do this every week for a while. How about... Oh, no. That's okay. I, uh, I, I'm recording from a desktop now, not a, my laptop, because laptops suck. So I'm never going to record a show from a laptop again. There will always be desktops. And I've got my... Because my office is getting redone right now of all the plumbing and stuff, I've got my, my desktop computer sitting <laughs> on the kitchen table, which is why I'm, I'm sort of, you can see the kitchen behind me, because that's where I've got to be right now while, while my, my office is a mess of, uh, of gyp rock and, and plumbing and dripping pipes. So anyway, um, yeah, so here we are. But, uh, but the problem is I've got like USB speakers, and I've got to switch things, so anyway. It's a, it's a pain. I'm sure people are really excited. Uh, you know what's really exciting is that SpaceX right now is uh, is steaming a barge out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean in preparation to land a rocket on it. That is exciting. I agree. Oh, you don't you don't sound excited enough. I'm I'm still on my second cup of coffee. All right. Well, I'm see I'm on my third. So that's the thing. I'm already like of one whole caffeine dimension beyond you, comprehending <laughs> things that you can't even imagine. I, um, I was I was overly caffeinated last show. I'm under caffeinated this show. Next show will be perfect. Will be perfectly in tune. Yeah, this is crazy. So if this were now now for people sort of aren't aware of this sort of like the SpaceX's big thing now, their big their new plan or you know they've been working on this for a couple of years now is to essentially have. Uh, stages of rockets take off and then land again. Which, if they could figure this out and they can make, because right now when you look at an, like an Atlas or a uh, or a Delta rocket or an Ariane five, all of the parts, even the even the SpaceX Falcons, the all of the lower stages of these rockets are just destroyed. And it is the yeah. equivalent of you getting on an airplane, flying across the Atlantic, and then them just lighting the airplane on fire on the on the you know. On the uh, on the tarmac, which is crazy, and so and this is this is the analogy that Elon Musk has used, and so now the idea is that we can actually land these things, and by we I mean they, by they I mean SpaceX can land these things on uh, a platform, and uh, ideally, eventually, the plan is to land them back at the Kennedy Space Center. But the uh, U.S. military isn't allowing them to do that until they can prove that they can do this very safely. And so valid. That is valid. <laughs> yes, it is very valid. Absolutely. And so, <laughs> but what's what's amazing is like landing your rocket uh, back at the Kennedy Space Center is an or probably an order of magnitude easier because you've got like a big wide open space. It's a it's it's not moving. It's a very stable platform that you would be landing on that happens to have people living around it. So that's bad. But but instead, to prove that this is safe and that it works and that they're going to work on all the bugs, they're going to land on this... Uh, they're going to land on this floating platform, this barge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And so it's like hitting a... A, a moving target that's going to be rocking. There's going to be wind and storms, and it's... Well, hopefully no storms. <clears throat> well, still, it's... Yeah. It's a, it, it'll be a tremendous accomplishment. It's like a 300 foot, or what is it, 100 foot across target. Like, it's crazy. It's yeah, crazy that they're going to pull this off. Yeah. And if, but if they do... It's smaller than an aircraft carrier. Y yeah. and if, But if they pull this off, then then this is the beginning of a whole new era in spaceflight. That this begins this new path of reusable rockets. And I am, as you can probably tell, I, I cannot be more excited. So you could uh, you could have had four cups of coffee. I could have had four cups of coffee. Why are we here? What what is this that we do? All oh, right, this is Astronomy Cast, <laughs> um, and we're about <laughs> to record a uh, twenty six to twenty eight minute episode of Astronomy Cast, episode three sixty three, where we talk about where the Earth's water came from, and this came because last week um, we ran out of topics, and so we. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had a suggestion of what to do this week. And what's great about this episode is that uh, this is us updating the science. There was a new research that came from Rosetta that has has sort of really updated the idea on where Earth's water might have come from. It's one result. It's not confirmed. It's going to be turned over 14 times. But people are always asking us, when will the science change? The science just may be changed. 
So I, I love all the qualifiers that are going to go into this episode. I know, of course, of course, yeah. And, and you know, we're going to flip it back and forth. It's like asking, will Earth be destroyed when the sun turns into a red giant? No idea. Yeah, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. That, th those are the articles that I've written in the last 15 years. Has Voyager left the solar system? Yeah, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool, so if you want to interact with us, uh, you can do so. Uh, and so I've enabled the Q&A app on this episode of Astronomy Cast. It should say Astronomy Cast, because now that's my name. I am Astronomy Cast. I'm not Fraser Kane anymore. Um, is interacting with the audience, and so you can use the QA app there and uh, and post any questions that you want. We will, you know, gather them up, ask questions during the show. Uh, if I think I can worm them into the conversation, I will try. And uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah, because this is a new. This is no longer my personal YouTube channel. This is the Astronomy Cast YouTube channel, which makes more sense. And it's but, shinier. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to subscribe to this as well. But don't unsubscribe from my YouTube no, channel. No, subscribe to all the things. All the channels. All the channels. Uh, cool. Okay. So anyway, uh, yeah. So post your questions there, and we will uh, we'll sort of tackle them when we get to the end of the show. Uh, this is your way to pick Pamela's brain live in real time. All right, and uh, before we go, I'm going to say hi to some people. I'm going to say hi to Nancy Graziano, Helga Bjorkog, Jim Meeker. I'm going to say hi to Tony Lynch and Todd Howard and Hugo Burnham and James Boston and Nathaniel Sanchez and Seth Dustbunny. Wow, it's a big crowd today. And Douglas Crandall. Uh, did I say Guido Bibra? If not, I should say it three times. Um, and Halcyon Forever. So, hey, folks, thanks for watching, and uh, let's get cracking on today's show. Are you, uh, where would you say you are in the readiness level? Uh, noting that we also have someone named Sev Dust Bunny watching. Yeah, I know. That's awesome. <laughs> I, love, I love the names that pop up. Um, I just need to press record. Are you ready to press record? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm pressing record. I'm in mono. It's recording. Life is good. Hello, Preston. All right. I am also recording. How do I do this again? Oh, right. Okay. Astro <laughs> Astronomy Cast, episode 363. Where did the Earth's water come from? Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. And we are, at this point, at the time that we are recording, we do not know what happened with the SpaceX launch and if it's going to land on a uh, floating platform in the ocean. But by the time you listen to it, you will know if it happened. So, uh, hooray! Or, um, too we're bad. We're sorry. Yeah, we're sorry, and maybe next time. But awesome technology attempt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, we should get a little housekeeping in order, which is that you should uh, subscribe to the astron the newly formed Astronomy Cast YouTube channel. So if you want to watch the full videos, you want to see the preamble where we uh, uh, prepare for the show uh, and then record the show live, and then we stick around afterwards and we answer questions from users, uh, then you're probably going to want to watch that. You can just go to... Is it Astronomy Cast? No, we don't have that yet. So mm. what you want to do is bounce off of our Google Plus page or look at our Twitter feed um, or just uh, look at any of the videos that are embedded on Astronomy Cast. I'll make sure that the link is all over on Astronomy Cast. Um, so the more subscribers we get, the more likely we are for YouTube to actually give us that pretty URL that we so desperately desire. Um, and I'm sure we have it somewhere in our collection. I'm sure we've registered it. I'm, I'm sure we own it somehow. But anyway. It's, they're, they, yeah. Google, you baffle us. We love you. You baffle <laughs> right. us. Uh, but yeah, go go follow your YouTube link to Astronomy Cast and keep up with all of the live, raw, Preston hasn't made me sound more intelligent, we love you, Preston, um, shows that are out there and uh, get all of the outtakes before they're outtakes. Awesome. All right. So uh, let's get on with the show. So where on Earth did our water come from? Well, obviously not from Earth, of course, but from space. But did it come from comets, or did the water form naturally right here in the solar system and the Earth just scooped it up? 
And this is uh, just to sort of give a little preamble in the show, uh, which is that we often are asked to update people on some science, and and we're surprised how most of the changes are fairly, I guess. Uh, incremental changes in the science and it's not like some big thing that's been really super different now but uh, thanks to the Rosetta mission and the landing and some of the analysis of Comet 67P uh, we may have a little bit of an update to to where Earth's water came from so so let's kinda go back and and set the stage here uh, where did the Earth's water come from and why is this even a question that I think we want to <laughs> ask Right. Well, let's start with why, why, why are we asking? Yeah, and, why are we asking this question? Is it so, obvious? The sky. Yeah, no, not so much. Um, so it's the reason that we have to ask this is in the early days of our solar system, there was this water line, and the asteroid Vesta is on the dry side of the water line. The asteroid Ceres is on the wet side of the water line. And the line, if you hadn't already guessed, passes right through at the distance of the asteroid belt. And I've got a sorry, I've got a great analogy for the for the water line, which is I don't know if you guys get this, but we get frost here in Canada, and the sun will shine, and you'll get shadows of like rooftops and stuff, and you will get frost, and then the shadow of the sun as it moves, there's no frost, and it is the frost line, which in the in the solar system and it is if you've ever seen that that's what's going on the sun is like literally at one point it is it is making the water go away and at the other part the water is able to stay frozen and and the issue here is if you were inside of the water line the sun was just blasting you a little too hot to hold on to your volatiles so anything that likes to become gaseous and highly energetic when heated went away and so the early Earth, well inside that water line, was a molten, hot, nasty, awful, but volatile-free kind of place to be, or at least largely volatile-free. And, and so any water that formed with the planet Earth that was on the surface, it went away during the early solar system. The, the sun just baked us. Um, so that raises the question of we are now a water covered world and that water had to come from somewhere and the story that we've been using for a long time is it came by comet comets bombarded the planet they made the oceans they melted and made water and and that was a happy story it was simplistic it was easy we make comets in our lab classes Nicole makes prettier ones than I do and um, they melt into water and carbon dioxide, and and this is stuff the Earth has. Right, and I guess history has been, you know, time has been around for a long time. We've got 4.5 billion years of of history with the Earth, although comets are fairly rare. We, you know, if you add them all up over billions of years, you would get a significant amount of water and a lot of destruction. Right. And and so we we like to have data to back up our theories because theories without data are just sort of fairy tales that may or may not be true and we're not sure. Um, and unfortunately, the data here is being confusing. So 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 sorry, just one thing. So the, the one theory is the comets. What what are alternative theories for where that water could have come from? I, well, it had to literally fall out of the sky, but not out of our sky, like out of space onto the planet Earth from somewhere. So someplace not Earth, water right. originated, that someplace came to Earth and crashed onto Earth. So that kind of means asteroids are really the only other option. But isn't there another theory just that the water formed in situ, that it was like essentially somehow water molecules floating around in space and the Earth just kind of crashed into them? Not so much. You, you can't really explain all the water that's on Earth one molecule at a time. Okay. So the, the other theory that's out there that doesn't seem to quite 
ring true is that there could have been reserves of water deep inside the earth that didn't get baked out by the sun and have since migrated towards the surface. Um, again, can't seem to come up with it in large enough amounts to account for our atmosphere, our oceans, and everything else. There is reserves of water deep inside the earth, but um, yeah, that, that theory doesn't seem to quite, as we've written it, match reality right now. So, so like the Earth could have protected the water from the blasting, like the, earth, the water could have formed with the Earth, but then the Earth could have protected the water from the blasting radiation from the sun, and then it might have somehow percolated up to the surface and... and... Yeah, so, so a better way to think of it is when the Earth formed, um, it was this motley mix of different compositions of materials and there was water scattered throughout all depths of the early planet Earth, but the stuff that was too close to the surface got baked out and there were reserves deep inside that the sunlight wasn't able to bake out. So if, if you think about um, baking things in a kiln, if you don't bake them long enough, you end up with uh, incomplete ceramic. Um, this is why it's easier to have solid objects, uh, easier to have hollow objects than solid objects. The solid objects, you always end up with pockets inside, which leads to broken ceramics eventually. Right. Okay. Uh, and so, and so, I guess where, so at this point, everyone was pretty certain it was comets. But then, what was what was the thing that uh, Rosetta discovered at uh, at 67P? Well, it, and it wasn't just Rosetta. Rosetta is just the most recent issue. Um, so, so with Rosetta, the, there's a spectrometer on board that is capable of analyzing the composition of stuff. Um, so it, it can go through, it can scoop up, and the instrument is called Rosina, which is the Rosetta Orbiter Spectrometer for Ion and Neutral Analysis. Um, and, and this particular instrument is able to capture ions, uh, capture atoms, molecules floating around near the comet that came from the comet, and analyze their composition. And what it did was it analyzed the composition to see what the ratio in the water of normal uh, H2O to um, heavy water, which is deuterium, it, it has an extra neutron, um, what the ratio of regular water to deuterium was to compare that ratio to the ratio here on Earth. So here on Earth, it's about one in every 10,000 water molecules in your average seawater is heavy water. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on if you like mysteries or you like solutions, um, the amount of heavy water found in the sample uh, from CP, 67 CP, or CG rather, um, it had way, way too much heavy water to match the Earth's atmosphere. But this is a single measurement. Right. Now, on a single I'm, comet. It's a single measurement on a single comet. And, and this is the third comet we've made this sort of a sample for. So we're now looking at... Um, the situation where comet 103P Hartley 2 has a deuterium to hydrogen ratio that perfectly matches the planet Earth. Um, so there we have one comet from the Oort cloud that matches. We now have uh, 67P CG, which totally doesn't match. And we've also sampled a, a comet that came from the Oort cloud. And it totally didn't match. So having looked now at three comets with not that much data from the three comets, we're sort of left scratching our head. But the thing is, heavy water and regular water are physically very different. And it's possible that this is simply a sampling problem, that with Comet Hartley 2, um, with its sample, it was much more active than than um, CP sixty uh, sixty seven. I'm going to totally sixty seven P. Yeah, sixty seven P P C G. Um, it, it it was much more active when that sample was taken than uh, sixty seven P C G currently is. 
So there's a chance that if you have a fully engaged, fully active, you are getting a representative sample comet detection, that you'll get this it matches ratio. Whereas this, the comet's just waking up, we're taking the first sample off the surface, there's, there's a chance that we're still dealing with differentiated material where the heavy water um, is what melted first. And right. we don't know. And, and this is where you have to start looking at the differences between heavy water and regular water. And so do we, I mean, are we fairly certain that 67P, this is its first trip into the inner solar system? We're pretty sure, but we can't be completely sure. Right, right. And so, I mean, you can get these long period comets, and they may take, say, a million years to make their orbit. But that would the... be an Oort cloud object. This is a Kuiper belt object. But that's not to say that um, we didn't just miss the sucker in the last pass. Right. So, uh, so I guess you can, and then you can say, so you know, if the sun has somehow been acting on the surface of the of the comet, what impact has that had? Has that been somehow uh, breaking down the ratio between water and and heavy water? So these are all a million questions. But you can, you know, you can rec probably imagine again the way our stories worked on Universe Today over the last couple of years. You know. Um, Comet Hartley confirms Earth's water came from comets, right? Comet right. Rosetta, you know, uh, Rosetta's comet can, you know, throws question into where Earth's water came from. It's this is how science works, and and it it's definitely um, a confusing tale to look at, and it it definitely starts to get at the frustration of not fully understanding how these objects formed in the past. So we do have these large blocky objects and the thing about looking at uh, 67 PCG is this is some sort of a modified shape. It is either a contact binary, it is two objects that are loosely held together, it is something happened that made it the shape of a rubber duck. Um, weirdly rotating rubber ducks probably don't form naturally in the early solar system. And so when we look at it, we have to wonder how much heating went with that. And the thing about heavy water is it... Um, thaws at a warmer temperature than, or it doesn't thaw, it uh, rather freezes at a warmer temperature than regular water does. Regular water you have to get all the way down to zero Celsius before you start getting ice cubes. Heavy water with the deuterium you just have to get down to um, 3.82 degrees Celsius which is about 39 degrees Fahrenheit and at that warmer temperature it will begin to freeze. One of the interesting facets about water is it forms a crystal crystalline structure as it freezes. And so ice cubes rise to the surface. So you have the heavy water has a freezing point that will cause it to freeze at a warmer temperature. Ice rises to the surface than light water. And we know nothing about the processes which would have formed the comet. Nothing. So it's, it's possible that based on melting and freezing histories that you could end up with differentiation between where the heavy water is and where the light water is. You have organics forming on the surface. All of this creates a complex picture where it is utterly reasonable to think, well, that blast of material we got came from a differentiated section of the comet. Now, I mean, this isn't the first icy object, of, you know, comets aren't the first icy objects that we've been able to take a look at. Uh, we've got Cassini that's evaluating uh, the Saturnian system. A lot of those moons are icy. And then, of course, there's the Dawn mission, which is going to be approaching which is approaching Ceres. Ceres right now. So so what's going to happen there? Well, when we get to Ceres, uh, 
there's this question of does Ceres have water geysers? There have been some observations made at far too great a distance, otherwise known as from Earth, uh, that hint if you overprocess them enough that there could be could be maybe 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 overprocess the image enough uh, water geysers on Ceres. And if that's the case, then we have the opportunity um, to start getting a sense of how much water may be uh, inherent in these asteroids that are at a greater distance. And the amount of water that asteroids have today is likely to be a lot less than they had in the past. So if we start finding asteroids that have a fair amount of water today, and we know that like the planet Earth, the asteroids experienced a warmer past, um, well, it could be that in the past, during the Great Heavy Bombardment, where we were getting hit with asteroids as well as comets, um, it could be that some of those asteroids, maybe they're responsible for bringing water. We I mean, we're really know. starting to blur that line between what is an asteroid and what is a comet, that there are asteroids with very comet-like attributes and there are comets with very asteroid-like attributes. We've had asteroids sporting tails. Uh, and even when you look at 67P, it looks like an asteroid. Well, it's 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 very frozen at the moment. It's very frozen. At the it's moment. it's very frozen, and it's also covered in dust. Yeah. And it just and, looks very rocky. And this was one of those things that I actually got into a conversation with Jonathan McDowell, and uh, he and I kind of went down the Google rabbit hole and. Um, trying to figure out what the International Astronomical Union uses to define a uh, minor planet, asteroid, comet, um, minor body, small body. Well, there's the, the Center for Minor Planets, and that appears to take into account comets and asteroids, and it appears that with the nomenclature, both types of objects do have their own definitions. But it's it's definitely becoming um, systematically more difficult to differentiate between the two types of objects. Right, and so I mean, I guess best case scenario, like back to the Dawn mission here. Let's say that you know, I mean, because it's going to be doing a lot of this analysis of the of the water. I mean, it, really, it's looking for water at at Ceres. You know. What do you think would be the best case scenario for sort of what we would learn with this mission? <laughs> best case scenario is is that spectrometers look at the water that is nicely frozen in easy to observe places and shadowed craters on the surface and goes, huh, that is exactly what we have here on Earth. But um, it, yeah, it's, it's trying to get those sorts of um, detailed observations. It's a small spacecraft. It's not necessarily going to have all the instrumentation we need to completely, definitively say yes. Ideally, what you want to do is go and scoop up a, a handful of dust and ice and measure it in a lab, but Ceres isn't going to get landed on this time. Right. But, I mean, amazingly, like, there was stardust. I mean, there has been analysis and return of samples from, from a comet, so this isn't entirely impossible. Well, and, and what we're actually looking forward to is OSIRIS-REx, which is going to do a sample return mission of um, the asteroid Bennu. So while the Dawn mission is, is definitely making massive strides in terms of imaging and um, regional spectroscopy, it's it's not going to land and grab a handful of, of surface, but the OSIRIS-REx mission is going to do exactly that. So it's, it's a slow and gradual process. When NASA and ESA explore our solar system, they do it very incrementally. Um, we, we started out with, um, with Mars exploration with Vikings, which just kind of landed and looked around where they landed. And then we had the Pathfinder, which was a little tiny rover dude. Then we went to uh, Curios then we went to Opportunity and Spirit, which were, were much more free wheeling explorers, but they didn't have all the instruments one might want. Now we have Curiosity. We're following a similar incremental exploration plan of the asteroids. Um, Dawn is is 
just one of many different steps that we're going to be taking and Osiris Rex is really the the next big step that we're going to be taking. The other thing, and I'm, I'm not sure if you've prepared for this, so so feel free to Google if you need to, um, is uh, that astronomers have done a lot of analysis of, of other solar systems, and one of the kind of amazing things is that, that extrasolar planet researchers have also detected um, Oort clouds, vast clouds of water and, and even ice around other solar systems, which is kind of mind-bending to think that this is even possible. So... So in addition to looking just in the solar system, astronomers are also looking out into other solar systems and they're able to, you know, able to see them at different phases of evolution. They can see brand new uh, solar systems that have just formed and more ancient ones and, and like, what does that tell us? Well, when, when we look at other solar systems, it starts to give us snapshots in understanding how solar systems form. Um, this has, in some cases, confirmed our understanding of early planets, sweep out these bands in the dusty disk of the early solar nebula. Uh, in other cases, it has left us scratching our heads because we have no clue how the super Jupiters migrate up to right next to their suns, um, but the hot ones like uh, 51 Pegasus. Um, so, so we're in this weird situation of we're we're, confor con we're confirming parts of our understanding of how planets form. We're confirming that things like asteroid belts are normal. We're starting to find rocky worlds. We're starting to understand planets exist in places we never imagined. Really hot stars, it turns out, have them. Really tiny stars, it turns out, have them. The only stars that we can't find them at are those that don't have a lot of metals. And that makes sense, because if you don't have metals, you have nothing to form planets out of. Um, but the, the reforming part of the solar system where it goes from uh, that solar nebula to migrating its planets all over kingdom come um, we're, we're still very confused about how that happens and uh, a lot of work has been done uh, here on earth uh, we're able to look around and say, hey, Jupiter and Saturn were in resonance at some point in the past. That led to a great rearranging of our solar system. Um, and unfortunately, when it comes to the basic understanding of how does the ion ratio in different places, how does the isotopic ratio in different places vary, solar systems are faint. Uh, in order to differentiate between deuterium and uh, regular water, H2O versus D2O, um, you need to have giant spectrographs on giant telescopes, and you need systems brighter than what we've been able to see so far if you want to get images that show what the ratio is snuggled up next to the star versus further out. We don't have the technology yet. But I think this, I mean, I know this solar system rearranging fascinates and haunts your dreams. Um, and, <laughs> Other and, things haunt my dreams, yeah. but it does fascinate. Yeah, but this is just this idea, right, that how on, how could you possibly get a, an object as large as a, as a super Jupiter uh, that close to a star where it orbits? And not in the star. Yeah, but not, yeah, not in the star, but a fraction of the distance. Yeah, a fraction yeah. of the distance from its parent star than, say, even even Mercury. And so you can, you know, once you've got these gigantic, vast solar system rearrangements, then then that's got to say that that all bets are off. That that everything's on the table again. I mean, look at Europa. Europa's got more water than Earth does. You just, you know, as a, as a Jupiter moves towards the sun, or as as, you know, as these planets interact with each other and they kick out a a a world, you could imagine one of these colliding with with Earth in the ancient history and providing all the water in, in one go. So all bets are off. Well, we all bets are off currently, but there is the possibility of saying. Okay, so when we have a more realistic sample from 67 PCG, oh, hey, it, it like Hartley 2, does actually match the planet Earth. We need that second, third, fourth, fifth measurement as the comet gets more active. Uh, right now we know that even just one of these high 
deuterium ratio objects hitting the earth would have thrown off our ratios. So because it's so easy to pollute the amount of water we have with just one comet, um, yeah, all bets are off the table, but at the same time, we can also say some theories are off the table. Yep. So if you had to make a guess right now, based on sort of what you've synthesized from your uh, reading, yes. where do you, where, what do you feel is the most likely theory of where the Earth's water came from? Um, my gut is telling me that when we get more data from 67P CG, uh, we're likely to see a different uh, ratio of deuterium and hydrogen. Um, and we'll find that a combination of Kuiper belt and asteroids can account for the water. But that's my gut. My gut mm -hmm. is not data. My gut occasionally believes in fairy tales. Yeah. Um, so so I, my brain is saying more data, more data, more data, more data. And yes. if we have more data, opinions are not anything other than, well, fairy tales. Uh, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. All right. Save. So while we were recording, I was Googling. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and, um, and I looked up, um, is deuterium poisonous? Turns it's... out it is. Very. But, but the, the amount you'd have to ingest, you're not going to get unless you fall into a neutrino detector. Yeah, no, the only way you're going to get that much heavy water is if you, um, is if you work at a nuclear facility, uh, which is... And go know. places you shouldn't. However, a disgruntled employee in 1990 uh, snuck a half cup of water out and put it in, have heavy water out, and put it in the uh, drinking fountain for the employees, and uh, but didn't uh, kill anybody. No, no, that is not enough heavy yeah, water. Yeah, you'd need uh, about 50, more than 50%, you'll start to get heavy water poisoning. Yeah, if you fed a newborn underweight, yeah, free no. or a small dog. No, no. If you give no, if you give a person one hundred percent heavy water, like to drink. No, no. But that one cup that they had. Yeah. It, no, no. If you gave if you gave a human being that amount of like just one hundred percent heavy water to drink, they would die. Pretty fast. But one cup is not going to do it. Not one cup. Which is still just kind of interesting. Like it's 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 water, but it's not water. It's not, it's not water your body likes. It doesn't bond the same way. And and let's face it, at the end of the day, chemistry is all about bonding correctly. And bondage gone wrong will kill you. Take yeah. that how you will. Um. I I purely in a chemical sense, of course. Um, There's some things that you can't say without it coming out wrong. Even saying what you just said. All right, <laughs> let's. Uh, all right, so let's. I'm just gonna make sure that this is uploading into our. Whoops, I didn't want that. Um, okay. And then start getting your questions ready for Pamela. Um, can you clear out the Dropbox again? Yeah. Wait. That would be great. There's okay. about 20, no, 10 episodes in there, both of our audio. All right, questions. I'm ready. And go subscribe to our YouTube page. Um, aw, okay, so J Judy Schmidt says, aw, I didn't write a message, so I didn't get a greeting. Judy Schmidt, hello. Hi. Uh, also known as Gekzilla. And she, uh, you should check out her Flickr page. She does some amazing uh, reprocessing of Hubble photos. Cool. Yeah, uh, fantastic. So there you go. I hope I made it up to you. And Thomas Tranaker. So uh, he says, did we see different isotopes in water on Earth so we can trace them back to different origins? I guess that's what we, we talked about, right? Yeah. Oh, actually, no, that's a good question. So, so do we, we have one isotope of water. But, like, would you get a different isotope of water in, I don't know, uh, the bottom of a core sample from Antarctica than what you would get from recent rainwater? Or is it all just you, merged you will together? Get, so, so you can actually grab water samples from anywhere on the planet 
And by looking at isotopic ratios as well as trace elements, uh, pollutants, all that other sort of stuff, you can pretty much tell exactly where on the planet that water came from. Wow. So this also do... works with human teeth. <laughs> so if you grab a human being, remove a tooth, you can pretty much tell where they were when they were quite small. That's, that's so cool. Science. All right. This is really cool when you start reading archaeological papers uh, because they're they're kind of big on grabbing bones and telling where dead warriors originated versus where they died and got frozen or buried or peated or however their body got preserved. Right. Uh, Helg Birkog says, uh, has somebody calculated the number of comets necessary to provide the volume of water on Earth? Of course yes, they have. I do not know the number, but yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, let me just, let me That's just, like a homework problem. <laughs> yeah. How many comets? The average comet is foo and has a ratio of composition of foo bar, and the amount of water on the planet Earth is foozilla. Calculate as follows. Uh, yes, someone has done the math somewhere. I don't know. I haven't been able to find it quickly, but I'm sure... You it's because it's a homework problem. <laughs> right. Really, it's a homework problem. Right. It's, a, it's a volume volume of water, average volume in a comet, uh, divide one number to the other. Okay. Um, so Hugo Burnham says, if Thea had a similar composition to Europa, could any of its water have been transferred to Earth after collision or would it all have been lost? So Thea is the theoretical Mars-sized object that crashed into the Earth right. uh, back you know, a billion or half billion years after the Earth formed. And so if it was like Europa, which I had sort of been mentioning, could its water have been transferred to Earth after collision or would it all have been lost? So, so the starting point is that Thea and Earth both formed inside of the asteroid belt. And because they both formed inside of the asteroid belt, they were both inside of that water line of hot, volatile, destroying nastiness from the sun. So, no. But again, theories, fairy tales. Yeah. More data. More data, please. Data, please. Okay. Um... Does, and so I got, I got people thinking. So Nathaniel Sanchez <laughs> asks, uh, does anybody know of the water isotopes on, on Europa? Like, I wonder what kind of deuterium is. Um, no, because Europa doesn't have uh, reproducible geysers. Um, there were images taken with Hubble a number of years ago where it appeared uh, that there were geysers on Europa Hubble hasn't been able to rediscover geysers on Europa. Um, there is hope that we'll be able to send a mission in the future that will either go, why yes, yes there are geysers, and fly through them and get samples, because that's a good way not to pollute the surface of Europa with Earth microbes. Um, but for now we're kind of stuck. What I'm wondering is if Cassini has um, gotten the deuterium to hydrogen ratio for Enceladus. But it is this a thing that you need to have a lander, like you need to cr take a sample directly? Like well, can you, don't, you don't need a lander, you need to either fly through the debris, yeah. which, which is what Rosetta did, and I know Cassini's wanted to fly through geysers, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's past tense or future tense, there is an upcoming flyby that's going to be really close to Enceladus, but but I guess that's a question. Right? Like, if you have a mass spectrometer uh, located on your spacecraft, can you orbit the moon and observe and determine the deuterium ratios, or do you need to actually, you know, swish it around in your mouth and taste it? You know? Well, I, I wouldn't personally taste it, but uh, swishing it around inside of your spacecraft's oven... Yeah, that's uh, what I'm talking about. ...all about that. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm not finding a paper with the D2O-H2O ratio for Enceladus with a quick search of ADS, um, but that may be lack of Google foo. Right. Um, you, you really... 
either need super, super, super high resolution spectroscopy with a really bright source, um, neither of which you're really going to get on a spacecraft. Right. Well, Curiosity has a laser, right? I mean, that's how it does it. It zaps right. with its laser, and then the thing fries, and then it 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 sniffs the uh, looks at the at the spectra of what just got zapped. Yeah. And is able to to help determine the uh, chemical composition of it. So yeah. that's what you would need. You would need some kind of laser. And and the issue is that measuring isotopic ratios is a insert all the expletives. Uh, I, I, when I was in graduate school, measured the magnesium hydride isotopic ratios in main sequence stars because apparently I hated myself in graduate school. And, and the issue is that you really need the type of a spectrograph that if you took uh, Fraser's kitchen and my recording spare bedroom, it, we still wouldn't have enough space to spread out, spread out the spectrograph. You're looking at a large classroom sized area of, of flooring needed to spread out all of the optics and optical benches. Um, you can't fit that size of a high resolution spectrograph onto a spacecraft and that's what you need to get at isotopic ratios unless you're doing mass spectroscopy. Right, okay. Um, let's see, uh, so Bryce Gregg says if Mars lost its water to space, how much other water is floating around in space? So this is this idea, right, that, that maybe Mars had more water in the past but because it's has such low gravity, it wasn't able to hold on to the to the hydrogen, which is a fairly light element. It was easily blasted, you know, floated away and was blasted away by the sun. So, how much water is floating around in space? Well, water is a complicated word. Uh, it requ it requires you to have a molecule of H two O. And if you have that full molecule of, of H2O, then it's not likely going to be escaping Mars very easily. Uh, you really need to be breaking that H2 and that O, which likes to be an O2 apart. And then the hydrogen, which has such a low mass, is, is readily uh, put into escape velocity through atmospheric collisions. Um, you, you hit hydrogen against a molecule of anything and it's gone. Uh, mm -hmm. This is why our atmosphere loses helium. So here on the planet Earth, every time you buy helium balloons, you're actually depleting the planet Earth of helium because the helium Forever. that escapes from the balloons escapes from the planet. Um, so when you look at Mars losing its water, what you're talking about is it goes to atmospheric water, it goes into subsurface water, it goes into frozen water, and in some cases the molecules get broken apart and the hydrogen escapes into space. Right. Very rarely the water will escape into space, and even more ra rarely the planet will get hit by something large that sends chunks of planet into space and whatever's in the chunk gets lost. Right. And it, this is similar to what happened with Venus. In this case, Venus had more gravity, but it was closer to the sun. And so the same thing. It just had so much radiation from the sun that all of the hydrogen got broken apart out of the water. The water, the hydrogen escaped Venus never to return. And, and you now... have much more complicated chemistry on Venus. But the oxygen then went to other things like carbon yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And, and so you end up with all sorts of nasty acids and chemicals and hydrocarbons and everything else. So, so chemistry um, makes it complicated to say all the water went into outer space. Well, it's the constituents of the water are floating around space and sequestered uh, in other places on the planet. But the Oort cloud is thought to have between 4 and 80 Earth masses. So if you ask yourself uh, how much water is out there, and the Oort cloud is potentially you know, mostly water, uh, it is more water than the mass of Earth by, by a, a lot. lot. Maybe more than all of the Earth, Mars, Venus, Uranus, Neptune. Definitely more. No, combined. it's... You know, yeah. so that's, there's a lot of water out there. And then 
and then you've got Jupiter, which isn't. So, um, so a lot of water is out there. Um, it's just frozen in icy chunks that occasionally visit in deadly ways. Judy notes, balloons are bad for the environment anyway. Wildlife chokes on them and stuff. Don't buy helium balloons. Fun yeah. is canceled. Yeah. Yeah. Save our precious helium. In the future, there will be helium rationing. It, it's already happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The only people who need helium are people who have instrumentation. Um... So, James Boston notes, uh, Hello, Space Tweeps. I can barely contain my excitement for the SpaceX launch and attempted recovery tomorrow. Uh, me too. Uh, in fact, I, I mentioned uh, to Elon Musk or, and SpaceX that someone should create a Kerbal Space Program simulation of this. And then, of course, the Internet shall provide, and somebody has sent me a video of somebody attempting to replicate the... Uh, the SpaceX launch in the Kerbal Space Program. So I am literally, the second I'm done with this video, I am going to go and watch that because that is <laughs> awesome. By the way, if you don't play the Kerbal Space Program, uh, you really should. It is the, I've, I've, I've said Unless this many times. Unless you have homework to do, in which case you shouldn't. Well, it's better than homework. It's homework. <laughs> it, I have learned, since, I'm not kidding you, I have learned more about space flight in you know, 10 hours of playing Kerbal Space Program, well, maybe more, <laughs> Play, but the time I've spent playing Kerbal Space Program, then 15 years of science journalism about space. That, that the moment I played the Kerbal Space Program, a whole pile of things about, about apogee and changing uh, orbits and the way certain kinds of orbital rendezvous work and the delta Vs and things like that, that all just suddenly all entered in my brain and it all made sense. <laughs> and it's amazing. So now I'm able to digest launches and my my understanding of it is so much deeper. So if you have any interest in in space exploration, in launches, things like that, uh, play the Kerbal Space Program. Um, okay, cool. Let me see if I've got anything else. Okay, so I'm going to give you... Uh, I guess an advance notice. So I mentioned, you know, the weekly space hangout is coming up at the end of, uh, oh, sorry, on Friday. Uh, so we've got a special guest. So the special guest is Andy Weir, the author of The Martian, which is oh, my wow. new favorite book. And, and they're making a movie directed by Ridley Scott, starring Matt Damon. Which disturbs me, but okay. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, and so if you haven't read The Martian, absolutely do so and then join us on, on Friday to talk with Andy Weir. Uh, have you got uh, any upcoming stuff? Uh, go check out the... There, I have them posted in my Twitter feed. We've been creating trailer videos for CosmoQuest, and we just relaunched the website with an entirely new design and a lot of upgraded features. So if you haven't been to CosmoQuest in a while, um, Make it your New Year's resolution to contribute more to science. Go check out our new interface, um, mark up v Vesta, mark up Mercury, help with the moon, figure out where where should all these Google Lunar X Prize teams go and land, and let's make it a more scientific 2015 and watch the videos because that's what I spent my Christmas break doing was creating YouTube trailers. And, and watching Die Hard. Yeah, yeah, that was, don't watch the last Die Hard, just don't. No, it, there have only been two, maybe three three movies, so. Um, no, there's five Die no, no, Hards. No, 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 there's only There's only. There's two. only one, there's the only, only one. Maybe two, maybe two. Okay. Yeah, Samuel uh, Jackson's. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, and his one was pretty good too. So, um, yeah, actually Logan Logan and I watched Die Hard as well, based on your recommendation, so we, on actually on New Year's Eve, we, we watched <laughs> Die Hard as our New Year's movie. It was I, awesome. I cleansed my brain by watching all the Marvel movies and the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in order with the movies injected correctly into the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episodes. Wow. So Someone's done ready. a supercut. I don't know if you heard about this. Somebody's done a supercut of all of the, uh, all of the Marvel, um, 
all the Marvel movies in order and sort of tell the, I mean, it's not an actual super cut, but it's like 10 hours long and it tells you where to watch on this episode and then watch on that and then when to watch a little bit of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and then to go back to watching Winter Soldier and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that's pretty much exactly what we did is, yeah. is I found a website that listed and, and it was awesome and now we're ready for uh, Agent Carter to start tomorrow. That's that's happening tomorrow. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's wrap things up. So, uh, thanks everyone for watching. Um, follow Pamela on Twitter. And or, and follow Fraser. There we go. As we talk, you can see our Twitter handles go back and forth. So if you aren't already, <laughs> um, awesome. Well, we will uh, we'll see you all next week. <laughs>